I'm Jessica McClain, a fourth year PhD student in science education here at Indiana University. And today we're here with Greg Sasha from Baxter. Hi, Greg. Hi, Jessica. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. So, Greg, could you tell us about your job at Baxter? Sure. At Baxter, I'm a senior research scientist. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. That means I have a PhD or I'm a doctor in pharmaceutical sciences. And there I work in the research and development department. In our department, we take molecules that we um, obtain from companies outside of our company. They'll contract us to take these molecules. They could be proteins. They could be very small molecules like an antibiotic. And we take those and develop them into a formulation and we develop the process to make them so that they can be delivered safely into the human body. That is amazing. So what do you wanna to talk to us about today? Well, what I'd like to speak to you about, one is injectable medications. That's what we focus on at Baxter. And these injectable medications can be antibiotics. So those medications that are used to treat infections, mm -hmm. but must be injected into the body to, to be active. There can be those that are made sterile for treatment of cancer, and those that are also used for vaccines. And these vaccines are used to prevent an illness, like I'm sure you know about through the pandemic. Yes, absolutely. And so that's what we focus on. And part of the problems are what we, we look at are one method of making a formulation is to make them in a solution and fill it into a vial. Or you could take that solution and fill it into a syringe so it's readily available to, to provide a dose. Another type of formulation is a solution that's initially filled into a vial, but then is freeze, frozen and then dried and then delivered to hospitals or clinics just in that form. So now there's a big challenge, right? Mm -hmm. How do we take that and get it into you? Oh, wow. That is interesting. So is this similar to, I keep on hearing this word, medicine reconstitution? Is You're that exactly similar? right. Okay. You're exactly right. Well, can you tell me what is that about? Sure. Re so reconstitution is what is, means what we have to do with this vial. So there's a solid in there. And the only way we can get it into a human body or even animals is that we first have to dilute it. We have to reconstitute it. And so what we usually do is we take a vial containing a diluent or usually sterile water for injection, could be sodium chloride for injection. We take a certain amount of this and then inject it directly into this vial to dilute it. But all of these multiple injections can pose a problem, a challenge for possible routes of contamination. Oh, wow. So possible routes of contamination. That doesn't look like it's easy, but I'm interested in trying on doing it. You think I can give it a try? I hope so. I'd love to show you. All right. So what we'll plan to do today is demonstrate reconstitution. And to do reconstitution in an aseptic manner, and I'll explain those terms as well. What we're going to do first is introduce what we're going to pretend this is. We're pretending this workspace is a laminar flow hood. You might have seen some hoods in your chemistry laboratories or at different companies. This particular hood has air flowing in one direction using a high efficiency particulate air filter, also known as a HEPA filter. This air is coming from one direction, from the top down. That's very important because this is similar to what occurs in the manufacturing area around any product that is exposed to possible interactions. So what we're gonna do first is we're entering our laminar flow hood and we need to clean it. We need to sanitize it. But to do that, I need to make sure my hands are gloved. So we'll cover my hands. And now we'll sanitize our work area. 
This is exactly what would occur in a pharmacy, in a hospital, or in a clinic. So we sanitize our work area, throw that away, and now we can bring in our pieces that we're going to work with. Our vials, so one vial contains the, it's called a freeze-dried solid or a lyophilized solid. It's filled into vials just the same as this solution, but then later goes into a different piece of equipment where it is frozen and dried. So we'll bring those in. We plan to reconstitute those. And then we're going to bring in a IV bag. So this is a, a diluent bag. This in particular contains dextrose, just a carbohydrate, sugar. And so since we have a sanitized area, I will open this bag and this is exactly how they're, they're received. They're in these kind of uh, hard polymeric bags, a little bit firm polymeric bags. And they're in there because the bag itself is permeable. It can lose water over time. So by having this protective layer, it prevents that. But we take our bag, place it in our hood. We orient it so that there are two ports. One port has a septum. That's where we'll place the needle to deliver the drug. The other port is for an administration device for delivering to the patient. And I'll show you how to set that up as well. But first, we'll focus on reconstitution. What we do next is you'll see that they have caps on them. These are called flip tops, and we just pop them off. On the top, you'll see there's also a septum. These are stoppers. They're polymeric stoppers made of multiple different materials. So we need to sanitize any surface that we plan to puncture. So we'll take our sanitizing wipe and we wipe in one direction across. Firm one direction and then we toss that wipe. One direction because if we scrub it back and forth, we're redepositing any organisms or contamination that we just wiped off. So we'll open another sanitizing wipe. In one direction. And then we also have our bag that we need to sanitize. And I oriented it so that the septum is up, airflow is coming down. And what we want to try to do is, as I mentioned, airflow is coming in one direction. So when we bring out our needle, we want to make sure that we never block airflow over the areas that we plan to enter. And we never want to block airflow over a needle. The reason for that is if we block this airflow, it causes a disturbance in the flow of air, causing what are called eddies. And these eddies can wipe across your other materials, pick up contamination, and deposit it where you don't want it to. So wipe that. And now I'll bring in what we need to do, or what we need for transferring the diluent into the solid. This is our sterile syringe. And this is a needle that has a safety cap. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute. So this is our needle. It has a safety cap on there because once we remove this cap, we never want to replace the cap over the needle. The reason for that is that that is one of the main uh, methods of workplace injuries in clinics and hospitals, of people trying to recap a needle and puncturing themselves. So don't do it. We have to draw up a little bit of air so that when we enter this vial, we displace the air to allow us to withdraw the solution. So this is the diluent that I need, I'm entering at an angle and without blocking the needle, I'm entering at an angle so that we don't form what's known as a core. If the needle goes in directly straight, it picks up a core of that stopper material and that could be transferred to your product. So now, 
inject a little bit of air, remove our solution. And you know, often you'll see clinicians or nurses tap it to get the bubbles out. We don't really need to do that with this one because we're just going directly into another vial. So now we have to transfer going into this vial. And you notice all this while this needle is exposed. In a laminar flow hood, we should be okay regarding contamination. However, this is also done bedside by patients where there is no control. So we have to be aware that there's possibilities of contamination. The lawflies solids or the freeze-dried solids are capped or sealed in the lawflizer freeze dryer under vacuum. That's why I didn't have to press my syringe in order to enter uh, the, the uh, solution. Now you see that the most of the solid is dissolved, but what we need to do is do a little swirling. Swirl it up a bit, and you'll see also a lot of foam. That's common with what we call large molecules, proteins. They tend to have a lot of surface activity. And so many times in the hospital pharmacy, this has to sit in the hood for a while until that foam dissipates. But also in research and development or even in product release and manufacturing, we conduct what's called a reconstitution time. That's where we place the solution into the vial and start a stopwatch. And we time exactly how long it takes for all the solids to dissolve. And that should be consistent between batches. Now I'm going to withdraw our solution. You'll see I'm just removing a little bit of the needle, not blocking it. And now I'm trying to remove the solution. And it takes some practice because it is a little bit awkward. And you see how it's kind of going slowly and that can occur just about anywhere you go. So we have to be aware that anytime that needle's exposed, there's a potential for contamination. So there's our solution. And now it can either be delivered to the patient as a syringe where we would remove the safety needle or more common is that these are really concentrated. And so we need to dilute them by placing them in these bags. And then it's delivered to the patient over an hour or a couple hours. So now we need to enter the bag. This is yet another route of contamination and inject our solution. So now we've reconstituted and we've made a IV injectable solution. This can now be given to the patient. How do you give it to the patient? Well, that we would need an administration device. And this is the administration device. This would be provided to the patient at bedside. So the nurse would have this administration device and I'll explain a little bit about what it is. We have a main spike that we spike into this port to allow solution to flow. We have this port that delivers the solution through this sterile administration device to the patient. And then we have this little device that can slow or stop the flow of solution. So right now it's open, we want to close it because we, are, we need to hook up the needle, the port. You'll also know or notice that it has another septum here on this administration device. That's just in case a nurse or a doctor needs to add another medication while this administration is in the patient. So let's prepare the infusion solution. Remove that spike. Now, place the spike directly into this IV bag. This is then hung directly by the patient's bedside. It's connected to the patient 
and then we start the flow of solution. You'll be able to see it start flowing. I'll shut it off right there. So there's another method of reconstituting a vial, and that is by using one of these little bag sets. You notice this is different from the set that I, I introduced the first time, where it had a septum and a port. This has this strange piece to it. If there's a spike under there and it's all sterile. We still need to sanitize our vial. One direction. Now we'll open this bag and you'll see that spike inside. This is then attached directly to the vial. And we do that until it sets directly in there. You can't pull it off. And then this can go directly to the patient's room. It is not active until the nurse or caregiver takes this little piece right here and breaks it. And then the solution will enter the vial. Now we just transfer solution in and out of that vial until it's into your IV bag. So that's one way of skipping the whole multiple step reconstitution process. It's still used often, but this can be used for some small volume bags. Hope you enjoyed watching this, and I hope it gave you some ideas to think about how we can improve this and improve many other things that we've maybe just touched on. Wow, that was not easy to do. What happens if this process isn't done correctly? Great question. You're right, it takes practice and concentration. If this process is not done correctly, well, let me first start by telling you that these medications that we put into vials, we manufacture them under conditions that ensure contamination of particles or infectious microbial organisms mm -hmm. are excluded. Okay. So they are considered sterile when they leave our facility. However, when we prepare the medication and we have to take a needle and, and, and push it through a stopper to remove the diluent, mm -hmm. having that exposed sterile needle to the environment increases your risk of contamination. Oh, wow. And delivering that contamination into a vial. So the risk there is then delivering that contamination to, to you and you falling ill from another illness that you didn't have in the first place. Oh, wow, that's something to think about. It is, and it can also happen in vaccines. Those vaccines that have multiple doses from them, they contain an antimicrobial agent to prevent growth, but the needle can still get contaminated. And so it's very important to have a good understanding of what we call aseptic technique, that which you practiced. Mm. So who needs to know how to be able to do this? Anybody that plans to deliver these medications to a human or even to an animal. So that includes a pharmacist in a facility that's preparing these medications, or a nurse at the bedside of, of maybe one of your family members. They'll have to do this in a non-controlled environment where there is contamination. How can they do it in order to prevent contamination? Doctors have to do it in the ER. And there are many clinics or, or even nursing homes where these medications are delivered. Wow, that's a lot of people. So what are some of the things that could go wrong? Well, an inexperienced person could easily contaminate a needle and then deliver that contamination to a patient. And that can result in what's known as a bloodborne illness or sepsis. So these microorganisms can grow inside the body and spread throughout your bloodstream, which then can rapidly shut down your organs. And that can lead to death. Ooh. Yep. That's Pretty serious consequences. Very serious consequences. But wouldn't it be great if this process could be improved, you know, made simpler? Oh my gosh, yes. And I hope you and the other people that you're speaking to about this will help with that. Absolutely. So if you would like to help Baxter improve the medicine reconstitution process to help save people's lives, see if you can engineer a better solution. 
Who would you like to get to help? What process would you have? And how can you help solve this challenge?